All right, so I need to talk about four things before I start the video. Number one, I was checking through my analytics and it shows that you guys uh, don't watch till the end, meaning I have to put some things at the beginning. Don't worry, I'm not doing this for every video, but just for this one in particular. Second thing, make sure you join my Discord and follow me on Twitter. Third thing, subscribe to True Horror Stories, THS, and also subscribe to Gaming with Nickar. One does gaming and the other one does what I did similar to my Four Deadliest School Shootings video. Speaking of which, make sure you go watch that video after you're done watching this one, if you can. Okay, um, that's all I have to say. Other than that, all I have to say is like and subscribe. Wow, it's been a while since I've said that. Okay, enough of the bullshit, let's start the video. April. Well, it's finally happened. The school's been talking about this forever and it's finally happening. The school is taking all the French students on a field trip to Paris for a week. Mom is super excited about this because she thinks it will be a learning experience and a chance to experience culture. I don't know what all the fuss is about, really. I can just see pictures of Paris on the internet. But when I told mom that, she may, she still made me go. And now I can just tick off the answer. So the answer to who was in Paris was Greg Heffley. My brother Roderick went on a field trip to San Francisco with his grade a couple of years back and he said it was horrible. The school couldn't afford a proper hotel and they all had to evacuate on the first day because the carbon monoxide alarm went off. Well, unless our school gets some extra money somehow, I doubt things will have improved. We were emailed a list of where we were visiting in Paris yesterday, and even though I recognize some of the places it mentioned, a lot of them made no sense to me. Les Champs Elysees, Les Musées d'Orsay, Les Chumes de Mars, Les Sacre Gars. Roderick told me about some of the places that were on the list, but I stopped believing him after he told me that the Champ Elysees was a strip club. Where he got that idea from, I don't want to know. Mom told me that she had visited Paris in the 90s, but could only remember visiting the Eiffel Tower, which was just about the only place I didn't need help with. And dad was just as useless as mom because he'd never been to France except on a business trip to some place called Toulouse. Toulouse? What the fuck is that? I don't have time for this. I heard the Notre Dame is nice. Wow. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for your input. You are, you are so helpful to this goddamn book. No, thank you, Frank. God, I fucking hate you. Monday. Today at school, my teacher announced that we had to stay organized on the trip, which meant groups of four in the hotel rooms and to explore the city by themselves. Well, that got me excited. Fuck all the teachers. Our teacher sent us each a Google form to request our partners, and I put down Holly Hills and two of her friends. I thought I was all set, but when the teacher saw that, she explained to me that boys and girls weren't allowed to be in the same hotel rooms together. For, as, as I said, fuck, fuck the teachers, God damn it! So she put me with Rowley, Albert, and Chirag, which is like moving from A plus to a D minus. Wednesday. Today, the day of the field trip arrived. We only just got to Paris and I'm writing this in my hotel room. I can't believe it's only been a day since we left. Yesterday, mom gave me her old phone to use on the trip, which was surprising because the last time she gave me her old phone, I dropped it in the toilet. So you'd think she'd learn her lesson about this. When she dropped me off at school this morning, I looked at the other groups and most of them made sense. The athletic kids like Bryce were all in a group and Holly was with a bunch of other girls. Some groups really didn't match though, like Alex Aruda and Frag Lee. My plan for this trip was to get closer to Holly. My basic plan is to learn as much about Paris as possible, then tell her about it as we're there. Hopefully, she'll be impressed and will finally see what a great guy I am. Man, Greg is still simping for this one girl he knows he's not gonna get. Well, at least he's a trier, I guess. When mom dropped me off at school, I couldn't believe how many kids there were. It looked like half of the grade was coming on the trip. 
Mom was glad so many kids came because it showed that they were excited about having a learning experience. But I knew that most of the kids were just coming along because their parents made them. I got out of the car and found my group. Thankfully, it wasn't too hard because Albert can be heard talking from a mile away. He was telling Rowley and Chirag that he was excited to go to Paris because he wanted to take a picture on the Abbey Road crosswalk like the Beatles. So either Albert's just a fucking idiot or the school needs to start paying the geography teachers more. Then Mrs. O'Reilly, or 8th grade world history teacher, spoke up on a bullhorn just as Chirag showed up. She announced that every group needed to have a leader, who would be responsible for the group's safety if they were apart from the teacher. I admit, being a leader did sound kind of cool, but when I heard the word responsibility, I knew I wasn't the guy for the job. The others all wanted to be leader and started arguing amongst themselves. Personally, I wanted Rowley to be leader because then I could influence his leadership while not having to put up with any responsibility. Unfortunately, Mrs. O'Reilly already had the leaders picked out. She chose Chirag to be the leader, which is unfair because he was playing on his phone the whole time. The rest of us were pretty upset about that and we wanted to convince Chirag to let one of us be the leader. Then one teacher announced that we had to get on the buses. We started getting on, I knew at that point there was going to be a no turning back. Once we got on the bus, I could tell right away there wasn't enough room for all the kids. Some kids were sad, but I was happy about it. I didn't want to go on the trip anyway, so this was great news. I told one of the teachers that I'd be happy to give up my seat on the bus to another kid and I asked him if I could call my mom to pick me up. But then, get this. He said any student who signed up for the trip would get to go no matter what and nobody was going to be turned away. Well, I think that's kind of dumb if you ask me. If I were running a business, you'd see me turning people away all the time. But I guess not everybody's gonna agree with me because the teacher explained how we were all going to fit on the buses and believe me, I would have rather stayed home or fucking died. Because there were so many kids, we couldn't even sit with the others in our group. Now believe me, I would rather sit on Holly than Albert, but the end result was um, even worse. I'm pretty sure the kid to my left hadn't taken a shower in about 5 months. To try to get my mind off it, I pulled out my phone and looked for some games to play. Unfortunately, mom had made sure to delete every game I installed on her phone before I left. So I decided to continue planning Operation Holly. I went to Google and searched for the most romantic places in Paris that I could talk to her in. And I recognized some from the email we got. Unfortunately, I forgot that I was sitting on someone's lap and that they could see everything I was looking at. He didn't even say anything though, which somehow made the whole ride more awkward. After what seemed like forever, we arrived at the airport. Because the trip was so chaotic so far, I thought it couldn't get any worse. Of course, it did. Because of the number of kids on the trip, groups were split up between buses, so it took us what felt like half an hour to find the rest of our group. Rowley was already with me and Albert wasn't too hard to find because he was blaring music out of a speaker and talking about going to Abbey Road. It took much longer to find Chirag though and it turned out it was because his bus was stuck in traffic. The teachers made us wait inside until the bus arrived. I guess they thought we'd be more well behaved since we were in a public setting, but I've been a middle schooler long enough to know that 
that's not possible. I figured I'd use this chance to plan talking with Holly. While I was studying my phone, I noticed that Rowley looked a bit pale. At first, I wondered if he was allergic to the peanut MMs I left him have on the bus. But then I realized he had never been on a trip without his parents before, so he was a bit nervous. I honestly can't believe his parents even let him go without them. I mean, I wouldn't have. To be fair, I was also feeling a little queasy. I wasn't really very sure about the trip to begin with. I was also nervous about Holly. I had a plan though. There was another reason I was worried about France though and it didn't have anything to do with Holly. We learned in history class a while back that a couple hundred years ago, the French got super angry at their king and beheaded him. Now I know I'm not a king or anything, but um, I'm not sure I want to be in a country where this sort of thing can just happen anytime. <sighs> stay in school kids, please stay in school so you don't end up like Greg Heffley. I also thought of a great plan to approach Holly. First I would ask someone in our group to come up and ask me something while we were in Paris, like about the Eiffel Tower or something. Then I would respond with some of my research right next to Holly. Second, I would wait for Holly to ask me about something else since she'd have seen my knowledge on France. Last but not least, I'd buy Holly a lock at this place called La Pont des As or something and hang it on the bridge with her and ask her out when we got back to the hotel. I've had some pretty dumb plans before, I admit, but I thought this one was foolproof. A little while later, Shirag and the other kids on the bus showed up and they did not look happy. I had to sit on the coach's lap! Apparently, somehow a kid on the bus accidentally broke a window, so there was glass all over the bus which meant some kids had to double up on the lap sitting. My mom always tells me to count my blessings because other people have it worse than me, and believe me when I say, I didn't really get it until now. After we got organized into our groups, we had to wait even more to check in all our stuff, since almost none of the kids had bags small enough to fit on the plane. Then we had to go through security, which went just about as well as I'd imagine. The first issue we had with security was the dogs. I was fine with them personally, but it turned out that Raleigh was scared of them. I told him that he should only be worried if he had a bomb in his pockets or something but then he started to be worrying about terrorists. <sighs> Why am I friends with this kid? Once Rowley stopped with his gay ass crying about the bombs, I noticed that the line had slowed down a lot in security, and it turned out that was because some of the kids had decided to bring plastic knives with them on the plane so that they didn't have to use the ones the airline gave them. I have no fucking idea why they thought that would be a good idea, but I'm starting to question my mom's fate in the American education system. And a little while later, just in front of us, the line froze again. It turned out one of Albert's suitcases was filled with nothing but yogurt. Don't ask me what he was planning to do with that. I notice Holly and some of her friends pointing and giggling at Albert, and I was worried they were going to start making fun of me, so I started laughing at Albert too. He was a little upset about it, but I guess nobody told him that sometimes you have to make sacrifices for love. Hey, Greg, tone it down with the love thing. I don't think she even knows you exist, bro. After we got out of security and got to the gate, we started waiting for boarding to start. I figured now would be a good time to ask Shirag if he would help me win over Holly, but it turned out that was a bad move because apparently Shirag likes Holly too. I mean to be fair, the second area of a wimpy kid was kind of an indicator of that. I backed away from Shirag, but he kept giving me a dirty look, so now I have to watch out for him too. We got on the plane where thankfully, we didn't have to sit on each other's laps anymore. I thought we would all be sitting in coach, but it turns out that the teachers were sitting in first class. 
I don't think it's a good idea for grown-ups to have all these class divides because the next thing they know they'll have raised a generation of communists. We got back to our seats and I saw that the screens had a whole bunch of movies available on them which I was looking forward to. I asked Albert how long the flight was supposed to be which was a bit awkward since Shirag was sitting next to him. He told me that it was going to be about 7 hours, which was much longer than what I thought it would be. The video about safety instructions directions was playing, but I couldn't hear it because Albert was still hung up about the Abbey Road and blaring Beatles music. A little while later, the plane took off and we could start relaxing. I figured I should start looking through the movies, but it turned out they only had really old ones. I chose one from the 1960 called Psycho because I thought it sounded cool. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a horror movie and I stopped watching after a woman gets stabbed in a shower. I like horror movies, but I admit that one shook me up. I decided to go to the bathroom to clear my head. Since I remembered the only fun I had on the plane when my family went to Isla de Corral last winter was when I was in the bathroom. I stayed in there a bit and waited out anyone who tried to come in. But I was a bit scared too because I kept thinking about the movie and how the main character in it was killed in a bathroom. So I nearly had a heart attack when I heard violin screeching. Thankfully it was just someone playing it on their phone. I didn't know who could have done it until I got back to my seat and saw Shirag smirking at me. I'm not too certain going to France with him is a good idea anymore. I decided the best thing to do would be to go to sleep, so I closed my eyes and tried to get some rest. But unfortunately that was hard because the teachers ran out of room in first class. So one of them had to improvise and let me say I did not think any proper field trip would have had this much lap sitting on it. It didn't help that Albert decided to wa start watching Seinfeld with only one earbud in. And I can tell you from experience that there is nothing more annoying than hearing that blasting in your ear. What's the deal with toilet paper? God, I hate my fucking life. Then, get this, the pilot left the cabin and started talking to some kids about their experiences on the field trip and how a plane works. So I guess he was in on the whole trip too. It makes me kind of nervous to think what else the teachers have planned. I kind of wish the school wouldn't have everything planned down. Believe me, I don't think that they shouldn't have a hand in planning the trip, but for once, I want to have something unexpected happen because let me be honest, my expectation, my expectations, holy shit, my expectations aren't very high. Of course, I don't think the school should let kids be in charge of the trip because I've been a middle schooler long enough to know that that's a bad idea. Despite everything that was going on, I managed to fall asleep. But I was woken up about 10 minutes later because the whole plane started shaking. I assumed we were all about to die, so I started yelling but it turned out that the plane was about to land. So I was the only one who was scared. Even Rowley was fine with it, but I guess he felt safer sitting in the teacher's lap. Once the plane landed, we all got our bags and started walking to the door, which took forever. Thankfully, we made it to the door. And let me say, after that flight, Nothing felt better than being outside. As we walked off the plane and onto the ground, I realized that this was my first time in a foreign country. Nothing looked that different though, so for a moment I thought we had landed back in the US. We got into a crowded bus, 
that took us to the main airport terminal. Once we entered the terminal, Miss O'Reilly told us about the airport, which was called Charlie the Seagull or something. Now, I don't know if that's what she actually said, but I've had one too many experiences with seagulls in my life. Man, there are a lot of references to the Diary of a Wimpy Kid franchise. Let's see how much more we can find. I tried paying attention to what the teachers were saying, but then I figured if Holly saw me paying attention, she'd probably think I was a nerd or something, and believe me, after the screaming on the plane, I don't need any more problems. Of course, right at that moment, Madame Duchamp, our French teacher, announced that there was going to be a test when we got back home from the trip and it was gonna count for 50% of our grade for the entire year. So now I had to pay attention. I guess the teachers don't prioritize the love lives of their students as much as they should. I guess the, one of the teachers noticed I wasn't listening, so she called on me to answer a question. She asked me who was the airport was named after. Jesus, I can't read. She asked me who the airport was named after. I tried my best to remember, but I don't think she was too happy with my response. Um, Charlie the Seagull? To be fair, I could have been listening more, but I should get some credit for remembering the gist of it. I had to start watching my step now, cause I don't need to deal with both Shirog and the teachers. We took our luggage and left the airport for the bus to the hotel, and while we're getting on the bus, Holly talked to me. Maybe this trip won't be so bad. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to respond because she walked away just as I thought of what to say, but it was a start. The only problem is that Albert and Rowley might get in my way, so I need to be careful about this. Anyway, we got on the bus and rode through the dark until we got to the city. And I have to admit, it actually looked really cool. I recognized the Eiffel Tower and it was pretty awesome to see it in person. Of course, then Albert started laughing about what he called its phallic resemblance, whatever that means, and it's at this point that Greg should realize that he needs to get better friends that don't think the Eiffel Tower looks like a massive penis. Anyway, back to the story. But for once, the view was so cool that I could tune out Albert. Eventually, we reached our hotel, which was by the river in the middle of the city, and we started unloading our stuff. And for the first time that day, I felt excited about exploring Paris. We were all pretty tired, so we went to our room, which was on the third floor. The rest of the night was actually pretty fun. Albert brought his portable gaming console and we played Twisted Wizard on it for hours. We also tried watching TV, but we didn't understand a word of that. And right before we went to sleep, you'll never believe who talked to me, Shirog. Greg, I'm really sorry about getting mad over Holly. I can give you some advice on what to do. Shirag apologized and said he didn't like Holly that much anyway. He actually gave me some advice, which was pretty nice of him, including some French phrases that I can't wait to try out tomorrow. And that's when we went to bed. Thursday. This morning, when I woke up, I felt pretty tired, but I couldn't remember why for some reason. I remembered some stuff, but I just assumed it was all a bad dream. Until I opened my eyes. Apparently the teacher decided to ask Frankly to help the other groups get out of bed. And let me tell you, it worked. Once I got out of bed and brushed my teeth, I noticed Rowley and Albert looking over a piece of paper. Apparently that was our schedule for today. The first thing we were going to do was some group activity. I didn't understand what that meant, but Albert looked pretty excited about it. Yep, this is excited alright. Mm-hmm. He explained that we were going to explore the city by ourselves, and sure enough, he had another piece of paper with a list of locations that we could go within the around this met what the fuck is that word? Whatever that meant. Anyway, we went downstairs where Shirog was waiting for us. The teacher had just finished explaining the activity when we got there. But I wasn't really concerned about that because I noticed Holly standing by the door. And before I knew what, what I was doing, God, did I just repeat that line twice? Anyway, I went over there to go talk to her. I figured it was now or never, so I started with just saying hi. 
Jesus Christ, why is everybody in this story so depressed? Look at those frowning faces. I admit, I could have been more smooth, but it was too late for that now. I figured I needed a conversation starter. So I said the weather was nice, although looking back, I probably shouldn't have said that on such a cloudy day. She didn't seem to notice though, so I was doing surprisingly well so far. But I noticed she was starting to lose attention, so I pulled out the big guns. Last night, Shirab taught me some romantic French phrases to impress Holly with because apparently French is supposed to be a romantic language so I remembered one and said it. Je vais manger ton redacted. For those who don't know what that means or what I just said that basically says I want to eat your yeah I think we all know what that redacted phrase was. I don't know if I mispronounced it or what trust me it wasn't the mispronunciation you literally asked Holly if you can eat her pussy. I don't think mispronunciation has anything to do with that. But Holly looked disgusted and turned away. I turned back to Shirag for some help but he was just smirking. That's when I realized he had set me up. The groups were starting to leave the hotel so I went over to Rowley and Albert. Albert pulled the sheet back out and looked over it. That's when something caught his attention. Choose an option. We've gone through all of this in the beginning of the video. Option 4 says choose your own adventure though. Basically the program had a sheet of places we could go to and Albert said that we should choose the choose your own adventure option. Hmm, this is giving me major long haul vibes, but I don't know why. Well, at first I thought that was kind of corny, but Albert explained that it meant we could go anywhere in the city and not just the places listed. And to be fair, I didn't want to go to the Tolleries or whatever. Yes, I know I pronounced it wrong, but I already pronounced them correctly at the beginning of the video. So, we started heading out. I glanced over Holly and she was whispering to her friends. And believe me, I don't think it was anything good. That's when Shirag spoke up. Shirag said that if we wanted to do the choose your own adventure, we were free to do that. But he said he was going to go to a bar and drink some wine. When Albert asked him how he was going to do that, Shirag said that the drinking age was lower here. Alright, so, just to clarify, France has two drinking ages. One 16 for beer and alcohol and the other one is 18 for strong beverages or strong alcoholic beverages. We don't know how old Shirag is, I really don't know. This is not really canon to anything I, and it, this is not exactly in any continuity. But since this is my channel, we're just going to make this connected to the Diary of a Wimpy Kid Greg Goes to High School story. So yeah, Shirag's 16 in this, I'm calling it. I don't really think it's quite as low as Shirag thinks it is, but I didn't pay at any attention. So long as he was out of our hair, I was fine. Unfortunately, I think Albert started thinking about it too, but I pulled him away before it was too late. Shirag walked away and out of the building, and we left the hotel a little while later. We started walking down the street, but I couldn't decide where to go first. Albert saw this cool place with a green cross outside of it. We thought it was like a restaurant or something, but it turned out it was just a pharmacy. The green crosses were everywhere on the street, and it really makes me think how sick French people must be if they need this many pharmacies. After we left the pharmacy, I came up with an idea. I said we should each take turns choosing where we go. I said I should choose first because I came up with the idea, but Rowley said Albert should go first because his name was first in the alphabet. Sometimes I wonder about that kid. Anyway, Albert looked on Google Map and led us to a record store. At first, I didn't really get the point of a record store since we now have phones and Spotify to listen to music on, but it turned out to be a pretty cool place. They had rock music playing over the speakers and tons of cool albums, and you'll never believe what I found in the new releases section. I asked one of the guys who worked there about the album and he said that one day somebody brought a loaded diaper CD to France, got it played on the radio and it became a massive national phenomenon. The only thing was nobody knew who they were. That got me thinking, if I acted as loaded diapers manager and brought them to France, I could make plenty of money off of them. Unfortunately, that would mean I would have to listen to them play and I figure all the money in the world definitely isn't worth that. 
We left the record store 15 minutes later and thought of where we should visit next. It was my turn to choose and I was craving a sandwich so I took out mom's phone and searched for Subway. A bunch of them appeared but they had different names. I guess Subway is called Metro in France. Anyway, we found one a few blocks away. It had this fancy entrance that led underground, which was actually pretty awesome. I didn't get why there would be a subway underground, but we went down the stairs and into the hallway. I had a feeling something was off though when I saw homeless people in the underground tunnels. At some point we got to an open room which was like an intersection for all the tunnels. There were people coming and going from everywhere. That's when I realized this wasn't a subway, this was a subway. I looked over at what I was pretty sure was a menu and realized it was a map. To be fair, I should have realized that a subway train is more likely to be under a city than a subway restaurant, but they could have made it more clear. Right, so how is Greg here? I figured we should just head out and I asked Raleigh which way we came, but he didn't remember, neither did Albert which meant we were stuck here. I honestly can't believe I'm surrounded by idiots who can't even remember the way we came. Bitch, you can't remember the way you came either. Unfortunately, it had also slipped my mind, so I figured we should split up and look for an exit. So I ran down one way, Rowley another, and Albert did something that could only be loosely described as running. I ran as fast as I could, though I admit I could have been more careful. I got to the exit at one point, but when I got to the top of the stairs, I was in a completely different part of the city. I figured if I went back down in the tunnels, I'd just get lost again. But but I couldn't just abandon Albert and Rowley as much as I might want to. So I walked down a street at random and hoped I'd get somewhere. I walked for a couple of blocks when I heard someone speak English. I figure I'd ask these people where I was because that could help me reach the subway again. I heard the conversation coming from inside a cafe so I went in there and looked around. It smelled pretty nice in there though so I got a little distracted. Then that's when the person speaking English found me. Greg? It was Roderick. Why are you in France? I thought Roderick was helping Greg in the begin. You know what? Let's chalk it up to stupid running in the family. Roderick was the last person I would expect to see in Paris. As far as I knew, the farthest he had ever traveled was from the couch to the TV. I asked him what he was doing thousands of miles away from home. Apparently, Roderick was on vacation because some random record store in France had given his band money to come to Paris, but he had no idea why. I knew exactly why, but before I could tell him, he asked me again what I was doing here. I told him I was on a field trip and asked him how he didn't notice I was gone. But then again, I wasn't too shocked given that this is the same guy who once thought we were celebrating Christmas on New Year's Eve. I figured that if I stayed another minute with Roderick, I'd lose my sanity, so I ran outside, and that's when I ran into Albert and Rowley. I asked them where they had gone, and they said they had found a way out of the subway a while ago, and even had time to do a little shopping at a souvenir store, although what they bought wasn't exactly high quality. We hurried back to the hotel where we managed to catch the rest of the class before they left. I hadn't really paid attention to the schedule so I wasn't really sure where we were going, but given that we arrived 15 minutes late, I figured it wasn't a good time to ask. I was trying to clear the events of the last half hour from my head when Chirag showed up, and believe me, from the way he looked, whatever happened to him was a lot worse than what happened to us, and boy was he mad. He was cut, he was cut and bleeding all over his face, and blamed us for abandoning him. I tried to remind him that he abandoned us, but he wouldn't hear it. Apparently, Shirog tried to get into a bar with a fake ID he brought from home. Unfortunately, the ID was not only in English, but it also had some random bearded guy's face on it. The owner of the bar yelled at Shirog to get out because he was obviously underage, but Shirog kept yelling about his rights as American citizen or whatever. Jesus Christ, Shirog's one of those guys. Oh my god, no. So the owner of the bar sent his sons after Shirag, and they chased him into an alleyway. Mm-hmm. 
You can guess what happened from there. Now, this little bitch Shirog was getting kind of hysterical, so I excused myself and ran to where Albert and Rowley were walking together, although I didn't really need to because they stopped anyway. Apparently, it had taken me so long to get away from Shirog that we had arrived at our next destination, which according to the teacher was called the I pronounce this at the beginning, I can't be bothered to. Now, I'm not into old buildings or anything, but I have to admit, this looks pretty cool. I was drawing that cover when Albert started telling us about how this used to be a train station and that the this the ghost of a man who got hit by a train still lives here. Well, I admit, that spooked me out a little, but I thought it was kind of far-fetched for someone to convert a train station into a museum. So now I have to worry not just about Chirag, but about a ghost too. And if I didn't have enough worries, Rowley came up to us holding a piece of paper, and from the look on his face, I could tell it wasn't good news. Rowley was holding the paper with the list of places we could have visited, and the one we based our choose your own adventure escapade on. I was hoping to forget the events of the past few hours, so I wasn't looking forward to reading it again. But then it got worse. Rowley turned the paper over and it turned out there was something on the other side. Apparently we needed to write down notes about four different places we went to and we would need to write an essay about them when we got back to the United States. Rowley asked Albert and I to help fill the rest of it out but I already snuck into the museum by then. You see, Rowley's problem is that he always expects everybody to do everything for him. Now, I could feel better knowing Rowley would fix the problem though, so I decided to just enjoy myself. I heard the teacher say something about partners. Now, I figured I'd try to partner up with anyone I could find, but then he announced that he was going to choose the partners to go to the museum. And believe me, when it was my turn, I wasn't expecting to be paired up with Holly. But I was! Uh, hi Greg, I guess we're partners? OH MY GOD, SAVE HIM! Holly and I started off really awkwardly, which made sense because Shirog had been doing everything possible to sabotage our relationship. But didn't you get her in Dog Day- Oh, who am I kidding? I'm trying to put logic in the diary of a wimpy kid. Clearly I've gone off the deep end. But I thought over it and I realized that the best thing to do would be to start talking to her. Because if we hit it off, who knows what might come next. Eventually though, we started talking and I got to apologize to Holly for whatever I said earlier. Mm-hmm. I told her it was Shirog who told me to say that and she responded with this. That makes sense, Shirog's really funny. I couldn't believe it, Shirog had brainwashed Holly. Now I'm a nice guy and all, so I don't think brainwashing women is a good thing to do. So I figured there was only one thing I could do. Brainwash her to like me, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Greg, she, she's not an object, goddammit. <laughs> now, my mom always says I'm handsome, so it shouldn't be too hard. Unfortunately, just after we talk, I heard screaming coming from one of the painting galleries. It sounded like Albert. We ran into one of the painting galleries where we heard Albert, but when we found him, it turned out he wasn't screaming. He was wheezing with laughter at one of the paintings. I admit, it was kind of funny seeing a naked lady, but I didn't laugh because Holly was there. I tried to tap Albert on the shoulder to let him know he was laughing too loud, but I guess that he found that funny and started laughing even louder. I honestly don't know who thought it was a good idea to put a naked woman in a painting on display to a museum that a bunch of 8th graders could visit, but I figured now wasn't the time to stop and think about it. I motioned to Holly that we should leave but when I tried moving away I slipped and accidentally hit Albert who was laughing so hard that he lost his balance tripped forward and fell through the fucking painting <laughs> fell through the paintings crack and that's when the screaming started <laughs> oh god oh fucking god
Everything was in slow motion. Albert flew through the painting and hit the wall on the other side. I didn't want to get in trouble, so I bolted. I think Albert got up and followed me because when I got outside, he was there too, covered in cuts. Thankfully, just as we went outside, the rest of the kids were there, ready to leave. I saw Rowley and Chirag and started walking with them towards wherever we were going. Albert, who didn't seem too concerned about destroying a priceless painting, excitedly told them how he fell through the naked woman in the picture. Jesus Christ. Oh boy. Although we had escaped the museum without being caught, I still had a strange feeling, like I'd forgotten something at the museum. Uh huh, yeah, you definitely forgot something. If only we could find out what it was. I didn't have time to think about that though because after 5 minutes of walking along a bunch of dirty streets, we arrived at a restaurant and believe me, I had completely forgotten about lunch. We went in and took our seats which were really comfy and fancy. The teacher said they had ordered escargot for everyone to try and whatever that was, I was really hungry enough to eat. Yes, I know how it's pronounced, I just don't got the time for pronunciation. The teacher said escago was a fancy dish, but I took it with a grain of salt because it looked a bit gross. But I tried it and it turned out to be really good. Of course, Shirag had to ruin it. You don't know what escago is, do you, Greg? Shirag said escago. Escargo, fucking hell I can't do this, was actually snails. I thought it was a joke that French people ate snails so I didn't believe him. But then he showed me on his phone that it was true and that I had just eaten a snail. I didn't want to act rude at the restaurant so I tried to keep eating it but it was weird knowing that I had a snail in my mouth and my gag reflexes were it was working over time. I kept it in my mouth for as long as I could, but hey, I'm only human, so eventually, I let my instincts take over. Well, <laughs> you know, it, um, was it my proudest moment? Yeah, you think? Turns out that a lot of snail barf landed on Mrs. Craig, so she had me step away from the table to have a quick chat with me about table manners and being respectful. After our quick chat ended 30 minutes later, I got back to the table where something felt off. Albert told me that after I vomited all over him, Shirag got up and went outside for some fresh air and that he had been gone for half an hour. I was going to ask for more details but then Mr. Ward, our history teacher, got up and announced that we would be having another independent group time to explore the city and that we needed to meet outside the restaurant in two hours. Albert said this was a great for us because we could use the time to find Chirag. I'll admit, it was surprising to hear Albert have a good idea for once given that he had destroyed a priceless work of art an hour ago. I still can't get over it. But I didn't really want to go looking for Shirag. The way I saw it, he had spent the whole trip trying to make my life miserable. But I knew he and Albert were great friends, so I didn't say anything. Our group got up with the others to leave the restaurant, but before we could, the teachers had another announcement. Apparently, we had a surprise activity tomorrow. We're going down to the Notre Dame to watch the President of France, Emmanuel Macron, give a speech. I admit it sounded kind of cool to get to see the President of France, but we had other stuff on our minds. But right when we turned to leave the store, we ran into someone familiar. Greg, why did you leave me at the museum? Oh no. I had forgotten all about Holly. I can't believe that I blew my chat with her by leaving her at the museum. Thankfully, she didn't seem too upset. She said she understood why I was scared to stay at the museum. And then, get this, she said she wanted her group to come and hang out with our group. Now, I knew I was good with the ladies, but I guess I underestimated my own power. Any day, um, I would have said yes in a heartbeat, but I could see Rowley and Albert looking at me, waiting for me to help them look for Shirag. I had to choose between the girl I'd made it my goal to get closer to and the kid who made my life hell from the moment this trip started, Shirag or Holly. It should have been the easiest choice of my life. 
And of course, I made the wrong decision. Looking back on it, I still can't believe I chose Chirag over Holly. But at the time, I didn't think twice about running out of that restaurant with Albert and Rowley to look for him. And I didn't even feel that bad about it. We ran through the darkest streets of Paris and down the riverbank. We had no plan for finding Chirag. No idea where he was. But we knew that he was out there and we are going to find him. We ran around the riverbank for what felt like forever, but after a while we just stopped at some weird bridge that was covered in locks. I guess it was to keep it from being stolen or something. Anyway, the three of us gathered together to discuss where Shirag could have gone. Of course, none of us even knew why Shirag left, so we couldn't really put ourselves up in his shoes. Then Albert spoke up and mentioned that one place Shirag said he always wanted to visit was the Louvre. The Louvre. I wish I could spell, read, God damn it, and that he might be there. Huh? Never peg Shirag for an art lover, but I guess this day has surprised me more ways than one. We crossed the bridge and asked around for directions, but to be honest, nobody was all that helpful. By the time we got to the Louvrier, I am really sorry if I'm butchering any of this, it was already dark and Rowley was getting worried about being in the city at night. To be honest, I was a little worried too, but we still had to find Chirag. We wandered around the front of the museum for a bit, looking for Chirag. Eventually, I took a break and sat down by one of these cool glass pyramids. I guess that's where they keep all the dead kings of France or something, like the Egyptians. Anyway, the view was really nice, and I could even see the big arc a few blocks away. It's the time, wait, did I say it's the time? Sorry guys, I mean it's the first time I actually enjoyed being in Paris. Then I heard voices behind me. Some guy in a uniform was yelling at Albert. At first I just assumed Albert called in a fake bomb threat as a prank again, but then I realized we weren't at school. Wait, Albert has done that shit? How is he not expelled? And this wasn't a police officer. I thought it must have been some guy from the Louvrier or something like that. But then I realized why he was yelling at Albert. He wasn't from the Louvrier, he was from the Musée de Rose. God damn it, why am I butchering this so hard? And he was here because of the painting Albert broke. I figured museums had rules about arresting people on each other's property, but a couple of other guys who have been from the Louvrier joined him, and that's how five adults with guns ganged up on three teenagers. Paris is fucking weird, y'all. The three of us were ready to fight, but although we had a golden belt in karate on our side, I wasn't liking our odds. Just as we were about to throw a punch, we heard another voice. A familiar one. Roderick. I had forgotten that he was in Paris, but here he was, standing behind the guards. He told them to let us go or else. They said no, and everything after that was a blur. The next thing I remember was Roderick, Rowley, Albert and I running away after Roderick punched one of them in the unmentionables. I'll be honest, out of all the people to care enough about me to save me from several armed men, Roderick's name didn't exactly come to mind. We ran through the streets of Paris for what must have been the fifth time today. If I manage to get out of this alive, I am never going to France again. Eventually, we arrived at a small apartment building. We were on a small road between a boulevard and a park. Roderick pressed some buttons near the door and we walked into the building. Roderick was bawling, as usual, and Oli stopped to ask Roderick if he broke into this building. I figured that Roderick was staying with his old pen pal from France, but he told us that he bought the apartment and was planning to try to turn it into a recording studio for his band. I admit, I'd miss Roderick if he moved to France, but now wasn't the time to talk about it. I figured since we outran the guards, this night couldn't possibly shock us anymore. But when we arrived at the third floor halfway of the building and opened Roderick's door, we found the final surprise this night had in store for us. 
Shirag was there. I can't believe while we were running all over the city, Shirag was sitting here in Roderick's apartment the whole time. Shirag, despite what he'd gone through today, didn't look that bad. He had some band-aids on to cover his cuts and some of his bruises were harder to see. He even had a new shirt on to replace the one that I vomited on. Um, Ralbert and Rowley were relieved to see him, and I have to admit, so was I. Chirag talked to Albert and Rowley for a bit, but then he came over to talk to me, and surprisingly, he wasn't angry. He told me that after I threw up the snails on him, he walked out of the restaurant and decided to take a walk. Eventually, he got lost and Roderick found him. Roderick took him back to his apartment, but left him here to go look for us. Once Chirag realized that we would go looking for him, then he said something I really didn't expect. I'm sorry, Greg. I was acting immaturely, Greg. The truth is, I was upset that you were getting along so well with Holly. Plus, nothing has gone well for me this entire trip. I was beaten up, vomit on. I was just having a bad time and I took it out on you. So I'm really sorry. I hope you can forgive me, Greg. At first, I didn't know what to think. Then I realized that Chirag and I weren't really that different. I hadn't always been too great to Chirag. I either ignored him like, like he was invisible or actively teased him. I guess I'm just experiencing that from the other side now. I forgive you. I haven't been that great to you either. Let's agree to do better in the future. I sounded like some children's book character, but I got my point across. We decided to agree not to bother each other again and just work together to get through the trip. By then, Roderick had gone to sleep and Albert was asleep on the couch with an empty yogurt carton next to him. Rowley was asleep in Roderick's spare room for the band who hadn't arrived yet. I don't know where Chirag went, but I got into the bed in one of the rooms by the kitchen. It's been an eventful day, so I've been up for a while writing in here. But I guess it's time for me to sleep now. For once, life feels good. What could possibly go wrong? I'm sorry Greg, but um, looks like you've been taking some Butch Hartman classes. This morning, when I woke up, the first thing I heard was Shirag yelling for everyone to wake up. I got out of bed pretty quickly because I thought the building was on fire or something. It turned out that everything was fine except that we had slept in until 10. I didn't get what the big deal was but then Shirag said that the rest of the school had probably left the hotel by now and it was only a matter of time before they realized we were missing. I went to ask Roderick for help in getting us back to the hotel since he had been in Paris longer, but as usual, he was no help at all. Just then, Rowley spoke up. He said that yesterday the teachers announced that they would be going to see a speech by the President of France. Apparently a few years ago, the Notre Dame, this big church, burnt down the, an the anniversary of it is coming up. The president would be giving his speech there at 11 o'clock, and the school was supposed to come. Needless to say, we ran downstairs as quickly as we could, after grabbing a croissant from the kitchen of course, and out of Roderick's apartment building. According to Raleigh, Notre Dame was on an island on the river in the middle of the city. I looked at my phone and we saw we're north of the river, so we ran down towards the island. Eventually, we got to a bridge that led to the island, and I could see the Notre Dame. But then someone started yelling. I didn't see who it was at first, but then I recognized them. They were the guards from the museum. In that moment, I knew it. Shirag's apology had been fake. He had lied to me yet again. His entire disappearance had been orchestrated to get me in this position, surrounded by people who wanted to arrest us. This was Shirag's revenge. He led us here, to them, and it was payback time. Except it wasn't. Greg, run! He didn't need to tell me twice. Guess I was wrong about Chirag. While I was running away with Rowley and Albert, I saw one of the guards throwing Chirag to the ground and handcuffing him. The others were still running after us though. I knew we couldn't outrun him forever, but I figured if we got to a more public place, we could get someone to help us. As we turned the corner, I saw exactly who. Emmanuel Macron. 
He was here, he was, in front of the Notre Dame giving a speech. In front of him was a huge crowd and I could see some of our class there. Bonjour tout le monde. Who better than <laughs> to save me from the guards than the president of France? Chirag was still being handcuffed behind me, and I knew I had to save him too. My mom once taught me that there's this part of your brain that gives you extra powers when you're in danger, like in a fight or flight situation. Believe me, in that moment there, that part of my brain must have been activated because I ran twice as fast as I normally would. Shirag had done me a huge favor. He'd sacrificed himself to fix our friendship. I knew I had to do this for him. Rowley and Albert had run off in another direction. It was all up to me. And without thinking, I ran towards the president of France at an uncontrollable speed. My mind was blank, my legs were moving, and my heart was pumping. And then I made the worst choice possible. It's been a crazy few weeks. I barely know where to start. The first thing I remember after accidentally slamming into President Macron was being grabbed by some guys and put in a car. I blacked out after that, but I woke in some strange trail cell the next day. At first I thought it was the end for me. I just hoped they'd sharpen the blade on the guillotine before they used it on me. But then I looked around the room I noticed I had a visitor. Hello Greg. The president explained that the police and his security team thought I was an assassin and put me in this holding cell. However, afterwards, another officer found Chirag and saved him from that museum guard. They rounded up Albert and Rowley after that and they explained that I was only running towards him to save Chirag. A quick look at the security footage was enough to convince them that I had only accidentally knocked him over. President Macron said he decided to visit me to tell me that I wasn't in trouble and that I was a very brave young man for doing something so crazy to save my friend. I admit I never thought of it like that. I was just trying to help Chirag. I never considered that I was being brave. I took the moment to ask him if I could have a knighthood, but he just laughed and walked away. The, sc the school made us fly back to the United States right after that. I don't think any of the teachers were really given many details on what happened, so most of them didn't even know it was my fault. I kind of felt, you know, I kind of felt, felt kind of bad about it, but that went away when the school announced that we would no longer have to turn in those worksheets I didn't do. Back at home, mom and dad were pretty confused about why the trip ended so early but I wasn't about to fill them in anytime soon. Mostly they just seemed glad that Roderick was out of the house and asked me if I had seen him on our trip. Speaking of Roderick, he's actually making it big now in France. Some guy figured out that he was the drummer of Loaded Diaper and Roderick was quick to cash in on the fame there. Last I heard, he's going to do a tour of the country this summer. As for Plainview, things are a bit different here too. First of all, I, Rowley, Chirag, and even Albert hung out a lot more. I guess there's something about the experience that just gets you closer together. Albert, Rowley, and I go over to Chirag's almost every weekend now to play games together. Chirag's mom, his friends with a developer at the company that makes Twisted Wizards, and she got us a copy of Twisted Wizards 3 before it even came out. Speaking of Rowley, he and Albert liked the food on the trip so much that they started a French cuisine club. It's growing to be really big and their pastries and croissants are delicious. I'm going to stay away from the escargot. Esca okay, it's like the end of the book, I don't have to pronounce all of this. All things considered, the trip could have been better, but it also could have been a lot worse. I didn't get to spend much time with Holly, and I think she's still pretty mad at me, but I had a fun time with my friends, and that's good enough for me. Unfortunately, the school's planning another trip to make up for this one, 
and I'm not exactly looking forward to it, but at least it can't be as bad as this one. And that was the end of Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Greg and Franz. Now, um, I'm going back to school next month, so, you know, COVID lockdowns are lifting up, so I might have to make this month count, and I will make this month count. There are projects and videos that I haven't done yet, so for the next four weeks, it's just straight videos. Like, for the next four weeks, everything, straight videos. I will be putting my focus into videos, because I honestly want to make this the best summer that I could possibly make it before I end up going back to school. Um, other than that, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I really have to say. I will see you guys in the next video. Peace out.